Hi, I'm Maria Varmazes, host of the T-Minus Space Daily podcast. And this is AWS in Orbit, Generative AI and Resiliency. We're bringing you the second installment of the AWS in Orbit podcast series at the 39th Space Symposium. And in this episode, I'll be speaking to representatives from Rescale and AWS Aerospace and Satellite about improving space resilience and scaling customer success using generative AI. My name is Eric McCoy. I lead our enterprise, public sector, and channel businesses here at Rescale. I've been with the company for about six years, and I've also recently been uh, helping lead our Tiger team around AI and generative AI specifically, and how we're helping a number of companies out there in the industries um, to enhance the way that they're doing their physics simulations and get to market and do rapid prototyping a lot faster. Very cool. Thank you, Derek. And Kathy, over to you for your intro. Hi, yeah, I'm Kathy O'Donnell. I lead the Space Specialist Solutions Architecture Team in Aerospace and Satellite. Uh, I also, in the past year, started leading our Generative AI in Space initiative at AWS. Fantastic. Thank you both for joining me today, and welcome. So glad to be speaking with you. So, Derek, let's start with you. Tell me a bit about Rescale. Yeah, absolutely. So, Rescale is a company that has been around for about 12 years. Um, and where we fit in the space is that we've been supporting companies in their HPC orchestration with partners such as AWS. So the different industries that we support today are across aerospace and defense, space exploration, manufacturing, automotive, life science, and others. Mm -hmm. And the users that we're supporting are the engineers that are doing modeling simulation, the research and development folks, as well as the scientific researchers out there. Um, specifically to some of the use cases that we are looking to do uh, for our customers is we're giving them the ability to explore wider design spaces and take the physical testing aspect uh, down and be able to do more prototyping in a digital world in order to get to market a lot faster and to be able to deliver on deadlines in a secure fashion. You mentioned security and I wanted to ask about that because I imagine given what Rescale does, you have a lot of government customers. So can you tell me about what your government customers are looking for in security? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is something that's really evolved over the last few years. We've seen a major increase in the way that the government and their partners are adopting cloud. Hmm. And with that has come a lot of regulation and constraints around the security of their data, of the way that they're doing compute. And so there's a number of different accreditations out there that uh, customers of ours, as well as ourselves, have been achieving along the way with great partners like AWS. Those uh, include, but are not limited to, FedRAMP, ITAR, uh, IL-5, IL-6, and beyond. Um, this ultimately is an impact level of uh, data security, as well as the ability to make sure that customers are able to scale out mm. as they look at these mission-ready um, type of initiatives that they're winning and delivering for the government. So it's an area that most customers are struggling with in a number of areas because there's a lot of nuances. And yeah. on top of that, there's also a lot of different components in the technology stack mm. that need to be taken into consideration. There's data layers, there's compute layers, there are third parties that you're using for metadata and uh, logging and so forth. Oh. We're fortunate to have a tightly lined relationship with AWS where we take advantage of their full catalog and expertise in order to make sure we can create a full turnkey solution for the market. Fantastic, fantastic. Kathy, did you want to add anything to that? Or? Oh, no, I'm just really excited to have partners that care so much about security. Mm. Because, you know, a lot of our customers, that is so key. And we don't want people to think that the cloud is less secure when in fact, you know, that is one of our primary jobs at AWS is ensuring that security. So it's just really great to hear our partners also carrying that like uh, tenant with them. Fantastic. So we are here to talk about AI and generative AI these days. So can you tell me a bit more about how generative AI and AI factor into your customers' missions and their security concerns? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a number of ways that we could take this. And I think the first thing I would say is that um, in the world that Kathy and I you know, are working within, 
a lot of the simulations that people are doing around physics. And physics introduces um, a different component to generative AI, where we've heard a lot in the market about large language models. Yes. Where I think that we, we typically see more is around large physics models. And what comes with that is still the same requirements around compute and infrastructure and orchestration, but it also um, brings in a lot of nuances around what is stability around the physics, how do we actually look at these problems, how do we orchestrate a foundation to make sure that we can build upon the data over a number of historical years, future years, bringing in real data as well as synthetic data to ultimately get a verification or a validation that makes us comfortable with running against our traditional solvers. Um, so where our customers are leaning in a lot is looking at how do we create these neural networks and so forth to get a lot further in our simulations a lot faster. Hmm. How do we take the traditional workloads that are scaling up to hundreds of thousands of cores and taking multiple days to run down to just hours or minutes. Yeah. But I don't know if you have any thoughts, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I love about working with the cloud is that ability to scale when you need to scale. Yeah. So traditionally, like back in the day, back when I was a youngster, <laughs> um, you know, we had to provision all of that and it was very expensive. It took a long time to do. And then when you were done with it, what would you do with mm. all that compute? Yeah. So I, one of the things that I love about AWS and just the cloud structure in general, it's that ability to scale up quickly and to bring it down when you've completed your work. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would also add to that, you know, one of the great things about the cloud is having the ability to have a fragmented architecture catalog. So, um, you know, obviously there's new GPUs and CPUs coming out all the time. All the time, yep. And within the physics and modeling and simulation world, there are a lot of dependencies based on the workflow you're doing with the different infrastructure that's optimized for it. Yeah. And having the accessibility in a, pl in a product like AWS to be able to span across all of those, so you have the heterogeneity to be able to go out there and do small te test cases, but then you have a homogeneous cluster to scale when needed. Once you get to that validation stage and you say, okay, I'm starting to get more comfortable with this. Now I want to run something at scale. Yeah. You have the flexibility to really put those things together. Yeah, can you tell, tell me a bit more about like that customer experience doing what you just mentioned? I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the way that we've approached the problem is that we truly want to mimic the way that AWS builds their business model where they do have flexibility for on-demand infrastructure as well as other components of the technology stack. And where we really leverage our platform is being able to allow customers to go in there and choose what they want mm. immediately. So the traditional method that customers go through is that when they go into a partnership with us in AWS is we set them up in you know, two to three weeks time where traditionally that can take months on end from mm. supply chain issues if they are looking to to develop their own infrastructure and set that up, do the different OS layers and so forth. Well, we have that all pre-configured and installed and we work with our AWS counterparts to make sure that we optimize based on all of the different software vendors available out there with different solvers. We also support a number of government codes as we've talked about, yep. such as NASA Fun3D, Card3D, the DOD Create codes. And what we do is we actually use AI within our own platform to recommend based on their job attributes what they should be using for AWS infrastructure hmm. in their workloads. Hmm. I imagine that also, I'm sorry, Kathy, I was going to say, imagine oh. it scales well, but go ahead, Kathy, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, that's super cool because, <laughs> uh, I mean, it can be really difficult. We have a lot of different options at yeah. AWS because we serve a lot of different industries and customers. Yeah. And sometimes it can be very difficult to know what do you want to use? Like which one of these things is going to work best for your workload? And so having a partner to help you and especially using ML to help with that decision making, I just think that's awesome. I just think that's neat. Yeah, that's a, yeah. You know, that's a very valid comment, honestly. Yeah, and I was thinking, as you're describing it, that must scale really well for the customer as a repeatable process. Absolutely, yeah. it does. Um, and, and we try to build in functionality together as we find customer requirements. 
uh, to make that very repeatable. Yeah. Um, so scale is one thing on the infrastructure side, but another area within this domain is the ability to walk in and have those different inputs you have, but have the job orchestration there for you. So building out templates and um, you know computational workflows and so forth. And those can become dynamic where mm. there's multiple different infrastructures, multiple dependencies where they need results from the previous step of the job. And so we look as a partnership to say, what is the next coming thing? As people look to kind of elevate the way that they approach, you know, the government you know, requirements and things that are are down the line for us. Fantastic. So we're talking about reducing those complexities, scaling results. So let's talk about results a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about um, how introducing AI into customer workflows has created great customer success? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've had a few different ways that customers have gone about using AI. Sure. Um, primarily, you know, the, the ultimate goal is that we get to a repeatable process where generative AI is the go-to. And what that looks like in the world that we're living in is being able to put meshes and geometries into a generative AI system and be able to get an accurate result out where we understand, you know, whether it be the drag coefficient on something as it leaves orbit because, you know, the heat and so forth has a different exchange there. Yep. We also see customers that are building neural nets uh, quite frequently on more regular workloads like computational fluid dynamics. And where what they do there is they take all of the data that they're running, they build the synthetic data if they need it, and we try to unify that data so that way you can build a neural net around it and apply that neural net to run inference against the job. And with that, you're usually able to see a 1,000 to 10,000 X speed up time with somewhere between 95 and 98% accuracy right now. Wow, yeah. Um, and then more traditionally, you know, we have customers that are looking for ML optimization. We have benchmark uh, space systems that we've worked together with um, where their typical workload where they have 20 studies and they're running uh, on, on a number of different CPUs. We want to reduce their time from eight to 10 hours per study mm -hmm. on dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of CPUs to accelerate that through GPUs or be able to accelerate that from you know, running inference against some of these neural nets. And so we look for opportunities like that where we can reduce their time down 85% or more. That's huge. So it's yeah. huge. Yeah. And it gives engineers the results they're looking for yeah. to be able to actually make the right decisions on the next evolution of their project. Make do those tests and get that data. That's so important in that that time to results. It's massive. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really interesting when people using AWS, it when it clicks for them that by using GPUs, which to be honest are a little more expensive per hour than a CPU but it runs so much faster yeah. that you not only have a time saving, you can also realize a cost saving as well. Mm. Yeah. And that, it's really neat when someone's like, oh, Light hey. bulb moment. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know, I'd be interested in your opinion too. There's always this debate uh, when it comes to high performance computing and AI between TCO and ROI. Um, and I do think that is like an interesting thing that, our, that AI and generative AI specifically it's kind of flipping the tables on this where I think that, you know, we're going to get to a point where it's worth the investment for the results you're getting. Because hmm. not only are you getting the faster time, but you're looking at a wider design space. You're going to create better products. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it is difficult to measure because I see generative AI as being an augmentive technology. Yes. Like it helps you do your job faster. Yeah. Mm. But how do you measure that? Right. I mean, you know, you have measures of FTE hours, but when you do knowledge work, when you do innovative technology, like, you're still working your entire week. Yeah. You're just doing much more cool stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, it is a big question. How do we measure the actual, like, augmentation and how much better you're doing. Right. Sort of like a gut feeling at a certain point. I yeah. mean, honestly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. Now, Kathy, I wanted to ask you about um, customers validating AI results to and ensuring customer trust. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we don't have like one singular way to evaluate results coming out of generative AI. Because if you've ever used like a chatbot, you know that it changes up its answers. Um, you can do a lot with how you set the parameters for that large language model. 
But we do have customers doing some really interesting things around testing, like coming up with a, you know, two or 300 li long list of questions with the answers that they want and then using another large language model to see if the one that they're using to answer like matches the answer they expected. Hmm. Um, you know, and when you're measuring large language models, there is a suite of tests that we use to compare different models in performance. Makes sense, yep. Yeah, so we were really excited because uh, we recently introduced Claude 3 onto the Bedrock platform. So that's from Anthropic, and it is right now top of the leaderboard, like Claude 3 Opus, uh, in those set of tests. So. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff, honestly. Yeah. So, Kathy, I want to ask you a follow-up question. Unless, Derek, you have something you wanted to add to that. No, I, ju I think it's creative and out of the box. I, I, mean, so cool. I, yeah. I love hearing these use cases. Yeah. I was going to ask about use cases. So, uh, AWS customers using generative AI, other use cases, anything you want to mention there? Kathy, yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, what we see a lot of, and I tend to split up use cases into a few different buckets. There are the use cases that you have just by virtue of being a company. Yeah. So, uh, you know, interacting with your customers, like having a chat bot to do that, having, um, you know, interactive websites powered by a foundation model. Then you have your business processes. How can you speed up, like, uh, search across all of your internal documentation? So we see a lot of customers doing that. I like, could so see the value in that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, especially <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> if you've got a company stretching back 20, 30, 40 yeah. years, yep. and you know, they've done their thing, they've digitized they've all of their done documentation. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now it's like, well, how do I how do I index that? How do yeah. I ask questions? And so you have to look through a huge index of or tables of content. Yep. But instead what you can do is you uh, load it up into a database that you can then use retrieval augmented generation and a foundation model together. Fantastic, yeah. And so you just ask human natural language questions and it will pull together all the different pieces over those two, three, four decades of work and give you an answer, which is so cool. Instead of asking your most senior person who's probably super busy oh, yeah. with that we institutional knowledge. We called Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so bugging Dave about it. You got, well, actually, Dave, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like, there's just a huge value add there for workforce development and upskilling. That's, yeah. you know, yep. I think all of us are employees of a company and we all desire and earn, you know, yearn for that. And I think like, you know, the ability to have that at your fingertips is in and of itself a huge value sure. to the companies yeah. to retain employees. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's yeah. nothing more frustrating. You're looking for those answers, and there's that one person who knows, and they're busy or they're gone. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, yeah, I can, huge value there. Yeah. yeah. And one of the big things we have coming out now is Amazon Q. So we have Amazon Q Business and Amazon Q Developer. And I got to tell you, so uh, there's a lot of essays here from AWS. <laughs> You should go talk to them in the past week. We've all really started using Amazon Q Developer. And it is, it changes the way that you program because it's not just code completion. You can actually like highlight sections of your code and say, okay, what exactly does this function do? Oh. You can yeah. say, I have a bug here. I'm not getting the right result. Can you see what might be wrong? That saves so much time. I it can't is. even begin. Days, yeah. days, yeah. Yeah, I've had at least three people so far tell me they've stopped using Google when they're coding <laughs> and have just started using um, Amazon Q. So yeah. Stack yeah. Overflow's hits are going to start dropping. It's <laughs> yeah. Well, I was telling someone, you know, back in the day, which is like two weeks ago, <laughs> you, uh, you know, if you had a problem, you had to Google. Yep. And then you'd get all the Stack, stack Overflow hits. And of course, it would be a guy with your same exact question. Who from, wouldn't answer the question. Right, but yeah. 14 years ago, <laughs> yeah. the top answer being solved. Yeah, and no no result. Yeah, you have no idea. What's the answer? You're like, yeah. okay, what happened? Yeah, yeah, well, seriously, I've been there. I have personally been there. I'm feeling that frustration, I remember. All right, so we are coming up on time. Before we go down that whole rabbit hole, I want to make sure we talk about wrap up, lessons learned. So Derek, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, so you know, I think I think overall, what, I, what I've been seeing in the market is, building a foundational platform in order to make sure that you can scale in the long term and that you can go down the exploration stage but also see the immediate results is really important. And so I think chart, you know, making sure that you're a good steward of your own technology stack and your partner ecosystem is really important here. Um, 
obviously we want to get to the point where you know large physics models and generative AI is an out of the box solution for a lot of these companies doing physics work. Um, so I, I do think you know my thoughts on it, at least from a personal standpoint, is that people need to do the fundamentals first before they move up the stack, mm. but also open your mind to be able to explore these type of initiatives, make the investments where you see fit, work with your partners and advisors and so forth in the industry, and make sure you're understanding what that ties back to from your day-to-day -day business. So, you know, I'll pass to you, Kathy. Great on, points, Derek. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. yeah. I think um, what I'd like to end with is innovation is key. We should always be innovating, but you want to make sure that you can do that in a secure manner, in a safe manner, because I know as you know, a programmer, as a technologist, I want to do the crazy stuff, <laughs> but I don't want to take down the company. Yeah. I don't want to ruin our code base. Of course. So, so making sure that we can do that securely and one of the things that I really like about partners like Rescale and about the AWS platform is that really is one of our key or goals yeah. is making sure that we're secure. Wonderful. Derek and Kathy, it was a joy speaking with you both today. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth and Laura Barber for AWS Aerospace and Satellite. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our associate producer is Liz Stokes. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazis. See you next time. <laughs>